My name is Richard Kohler. I work for Transgender Europe. That is a human rights organization working for trans rights in Europe. I'm the senior policy officer, and right now I'm sitting here in our office in Berlin. Um, I think we're facing a lot of different issues uh, in Europe when it comes to trans people. Um, I think a lot of the, the underlying issues are connected to ignorance and lack of knowledge. Um, which are then uh, multiplying themselves on the legal level. So we have a lot of legal provisions which are either harming trans people or they are not uh, good enough to actually protect trans people against discrimination, for instance, against violence, or just to have their uh, gender identity being recognized. Unfortunately, we have to say that there is no safe country for trans people in Europe. Um, you might know that Transgender Europe has been collecting information about murders or reports of murders of trans people since 2008. We do this on a global scale. And this year uh, we have unfortunately reported uh, murders from more than 1,990 uh, murdered trans people worldwide since the beginning um, of our research. And that is, of course, uh, very sad. Uh, though these numbers are for the global scale, however, still in Europe, um, since 2008, we have been reporting uh, 104 murders of trans people in Europe. That is, of course, only the tip of the iceberg. We think that there is uh, much more, uh, that there are many more murders going on, that there's much more violence. Um, however, this is only what we found through internet research. What we hear and what we see through research asking trans people about the experience with violence in Europe, um, we see that nearly every person who is somewhat um, visibly transgressing gender norms or who is visibly transgender is actually experiencing violence. Well, I mean, uh, actually pretty much every legislation in Europe is built on the belief that there is only uh, one set of genders that's only male or female. So everybody who falls uh, between those two categories actually is not recognized in the law. Um, according to the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union, that could be up to 50% of the trans population. Imagine if you want to pick up a parcel at the post office and you have to show your ID to be able to collect the parcel that has been addressed to you, but the, uh, the name on the parcel actually says like um, Mr. Tom, but on your ID card or on your passport it still says Maria even though you are living as Tom and you are also visible as Tom. So it is then most of the time very tricky to convince the person in the post office like to hand you out this parcel and it can be very intimidating. It can be that you don't want to disclose that you are trans. It might be that the person behind the counter is not giving you the parcel or is making transphobic remarks and sometimes other people that might be standing around might hear this conversation, might uh, ridicule you or it might even further uh, launch out into violence. So this just is a very practical and very everyday life example of the kind of difficulties that trans people are experiencing in the current legal setup. Well, we're working uh, like on four different uh, areas, pretty much. One is like to, to raise awareness, to share information about trans issues, because for a lot of people in Europe, that is still uh, very unknown territory. Um, secondly, we work with European institutions, so the European Union, the Council of Europe, for instance, for the with governments, to change legislation, to ensure that there is better protection, that there are better laws that are recognizing trans people, or for instance, that there are specific um, procedures in place when trans people fall victim of a crime, for instance, um, that there are uh, sensitized police officers, that law enforcement agencies are, are better skilled on how to work with trans people and not to, for instance, discriminate them again. Um, we also do, as I uh, introduced it before, like a lot of uh, research in this area. So uh, we provide information about the legal situation, but also about uh, the social situation, for instance, or about healthcare. 
Um, I think for me personally, I have to say I'm, I'm from the east of Germany, so I was still born when the wall was up, so to say, and the country was uh, divided. And uh, when I was very young, when I was eight or nine, uh, my parents would take me to demonstrations, public demonstrations against the East German regime, and we talked a lot about politics at home. So me being very young and participating in these very peaceful demonstrations, I actually got this very strong understanding that you can change a lot and a lot about injustice. Um, if you're just persistent. So I think that was kind of like the, um, the, the key moment for me like to, to become an activist in a way. And of course, uh, for me personally, as a trans person, it is also uh, it is a privilege in a way to actually work for the rights of other trans people and for the better of our community. I think the most promising developments for trans rights in Europe is actually to see that the trans community in Europe is getting stronger and stronger. There are more trans people who come out as themselves. There are more trans people who uh, take and uh, actually demand their rights. So we see a lot of uh, new organizations coming up or uh, organizations actually professionalizing. This is very, very encouraging. And I think that really shows um, the importance of the cause and that uh, we will definitely not go away. Secondly, we see an increased awareness uh, for issues that trans people are facing. This is reflected either in uh, governments or the European institutions um, having laws in place that are actually recognizing trans people's rights, trans people's existence. Uh, we have much better um, case law at the moment uh, coming from the, the European level, for instance, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, that would say, for instance, discrimination on grounds of gender identity is prohibited under the European Convention of Human Rights. These are very strong developments which are strengthening us even further, but even um, more uh, subtle and more social developments, something like uh, the very big and usually mo mostly positive reactions to the coming out of Kathleen Jenner in the US, for instance, or um, having uh, Conchita win the Eurovision uh, context, contest. That was, um, I think, a lot of uh, positive debate and awareness raising and a lot of communication that you could see people were talking to each other, they were trying to understand and trying to educate themselves. So we're seeing definitely more awareness and more willingness um, to take up uh, trans people's rights and uh, to, to have actually better acceptance of trans people in place. Um, very specifically, we have been very happy in the last one and a half years to have very concrete laws uh, coming up now that are recognizing trans people's uh, gender identity. Uh, for instance, in Malta, uh, this, this spring in April, the Maltese government uh, uh, adopted a law, the Gender Identity, Gender Expression and Sex Characteristics Act, which is the, uh, I would say, the, the gold standard now for Europe, as it is recognizing um, the right to gender identity and the free development thereof for all citizens of Malta. Um, it is enabling a very simple procedure for uh, a person who wants to change their documents um, and it's also prohibiting uh, surgery uh, on intersex infants. It is also prohibiting that any medical uh, aspects should be requested for a change of document. So you cannot be asked to be sterilized, you cannot be asked to provide a mental health diagnosis. So these are very promising developments. And uh, we also know that this is not a single incident, but we see a number of other governments who are interested in these developments and who would want to follow track and are working on their own solutions there. There is a lot of uh, question marks a lot of people have about why is it Malta that is now a front runner for trans rights in Europe. Um, the the uh, responsible civil servant at the Maltese ministry recently said it's actually it's no uh, it's no magic it's not the religion it's not the island it's not the sun um, that this country is now like so progressive on trans rights it's actually the there's actually two things that uh, are important there it's political leadership and it's the empowerment of the civil society to actually. Uh, enable uh, really good uh, interaction with the government to make sure that they actually come up with a good law. That is the problem at the moment. Um, there is no country in Europe that is enabling uh, people who feel uh, that they do not belong to one of the two genders, um, that they are uh, adequately represented. However, the, the good thing is with Malta that you don't have to identify 
uh, as one of the two genders. So for the future, um, there is the possibility if, for instance, Maltese legislation, whatever, go that far um, to uh, enable a, a third option, a fourth, a fifth, whatever option, or to oppose gender altogether, then this law would still work, so to say. At the moment, what is in place in Malta, however, for uh, children uh, who are born, um, the parents have the option and the right to not assign gender to their child. Um, that, that decision can be postponed until uh, they, can, they can be made an informed consent decision by the child themselves. Thank you.